should we be using mast cell targeted therapy before surgery? Should we be doing things to get her as healthy, quote unquote, healthy as possible, stable as possible? Will that have, you know, a, a positive effect long term? Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. We have a couple of really great practitioners coming on this show in the last couple of weeks. They are somewhat connected, and I want to give a little bit of context for better understanding. More recently, I have started to be involved with the scientific committee for ISWISH, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. So last year, I volunteered on a subcommittee that was involved with planning a symposium involved with inflammation and sexual health. We were able to bring on Tanya Dempsey, who is a mast cell expert in New York. She works with Dr. Larry Afrin in an integrative center in New York, and they specialize in mast cell disorders. She is not an allergist, shockingly. She actually started more in primary care, and I'll let her share a little bit about her story. I found it really fascinating. When I started going down this rabbit hole of mast cell disorders, because of some things that were going on with me, the small amount of research I was seeing involving mast cells and endometriosis, I found it really fascinating that there was really not a ton of research. There was a lot of research on mast cell issues, and there's a lot of research relative on endometriosis, all kind of alluding to the same concepts and themes, but none of the research was really connecting the two until I found an article that Dr. Tanya Dempsey had been involved with, where they actually listed a lot of the things that those with endometriosis have along with endometriosis. So I got to speak with her at the conference. She came and she did a great lecture on mast cells. I know that mast cell issues, mast cell disorders have been a pretty big topic in the last couple of years. And I've seen a lot in the different groups and forums involving endometriosis, not to mention in my own patients. Really excited to have her come on and talk about mast cell disorders and answer some questions that I have and just provide some information that I think many people ask about or have kind of considered themselves. I think when you start to put the pieces together and there's POTS, EDS, autoimmune issues, GI issues, endometriosis, heavy bleeding, skin sensitivities, sensitivities to different medications, a number of factors, putting them all together, which rarely happens in our medical society, maybe there's a certain population where this is sort of all one thing manifesting in different ways. So join us today for this amazing conversation with Dr. Tanya Dempsey to discuss all things mast cells, how it relates to endometriosis, what you should be looking for if you're considering a mast cell diagnosis, some resources for you, and how to get the help that you need. We have a lot to talk about today, and I'm so, so excited. I would love for you to kind of just tell your story of how you became a mast cell expert because you're not an allergist. Right, right. And mast cells typically are involved in allergy, right? So you would think that that would be the direction you would go. Um, my background is internal medicine, and I've always been um, interested in looking at all the pieces of a patient's, you know, uh, problems and issues. I'm, I'm looking at the, them as a whole person. I've always been like that, and and you know, when I started doing truly doing integrative medicine. Um, it just, uh, I guess it became clear that there were patients that had things going on that I didn't understand fully, and I was determined to figure it out. Um, so what happened was actually, I have a patient, this was probably around 2014, 2015. I started my practice in 2011. And so somewhere around, I guess it was around 2014, um, I had this patient that, had this sort of waxing and waning history um, of various of sort of I would call multi-system dis diseases or multi-system symptoms, um, you know, sometimes involving one part of the body, sometimes involving another part of the body with these flares that would happen. And 
it just something just didn't make sense. You know, there were there were pieces of it that sounded like maybe it started when she had an infection. So some of it I understood, but but some of it was that there was there were the, these pieces that I knew there was more to the story is the point. And so I spent hours, I remember scouring the literature and trying to figure out what I was missing with her. I mean, we were I was treating her and interestingly, I was actually using mast cell targeted therapy without knowing it. I mean, I knew I knew it, but I but more it was more like I think there's some alert quote unquote allergic thing going on, even though it really wasn't an allergy and she didn't have allergies, but I could tell that there was some kind of quality to that. And so I started looking and I came across mast cell activation syndrome. And, and I just, I, I just remember like reading it and thinking, huh, that's, you know, that sounds like maybe, maybe. And I remember having an appointment with her and sharing my thoughts and uh, she left the appointment and, and she's someone who does a lot of research also. So she started researching and she um, had a family member who had some kind of connection to the NIH. And that family member said, you know who the, the person is to understand mass cell activation syndrome? It's Dr. Lawrence Afrin. So she came back to me. She says, there's this, you know, there's this um, uh, doctor up in, uh, at the time he was in Minnesota and, um, you know, can you, can you reach out to him and talk to him? And I was like, yeah, sure. But he's going to talk to me if I reach out to him like randomly. And she's like, yeah, apparently you can talk to him. He just, you know, takes calls. So I, I reached out to him and, and I could not believe that he actually like this random doctor calling him. He got on the phone, you know, we scheduled, we did schedule an appointment. He didn't just get on the phone, but we, he spent, I don't know, probably an hour and a half with me talking about all the intricacies of the case and how to think about mass cell activation syndrome. And that was the start of an amazing relationship with him because after that, we, you know, we talked more. I talked to the patient. I helped, started helping the patient, patient with, you know, these things that he, you know, suggested. She started getting better. And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. So once I had this one patient, then it was, oh my goodness, this other patient and this other patient, and let me think about how I can help them. And it just, it just snowballed really. Um, and, and I, and I did a podcast, it was probably 2017. I did a podcast with doc, Dr. Ronald Hoffman, who has a, his podcast is intelligent medicine and he's a true pioneer in the integrative world. And I, and he, and we did this podcast on mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance. And he had heard me start talking about it at a conference. And so he's like, Oh, Hey, let's do this podcast. So I do the podcast. And I, I think at the, in the podcast, I said something like, you know, I'm starting to think that, that maybe close to 90% of my patients actually have this, you know, and I gave the whole description of, you know, what it was. And Lo and behold, like a couple of weeks later, after that podcast went live, Dr. Afrin reaches out to me via email and says, kudos to you. I heard your podcast and you nailed it. And I was like, you're listening to this podcast? <laughs> he said one of his it. patients, one of his patients had recommended that they, you know, that he listen. And he said, look, I just, you know, I just love what you said. And I think you got it. And I'm just so disappointed that it's just so hard to get people to really understand this. And, and it really sounded like he was struggling at, at the University of Minnesota, getting people there to, to, to work with him to help these patients. And I, I, I sort of made like a, a flippant response, you know, kind of response, kind of like, oh, you should come to New York because in New York, you know, we all, we're all open-minded and, you know, and he was like, oh, tell me a little bit about New York, you know? And I was like, yeah, you know, I have this, I have this clinic. I'm, I'm opening, I'm actually opening a new center. Um, I want to do research. I told him all my dreams to, to, to you know, that I, that I wanted where I saw myself going and um, my goal for helping patients with chronic multi-system diseases. And um, I said, do you want to come to New York? And he, I mean, he was on a plane, oh, like within the week. He was that on a plane. Amazing to New York to meet me in person where we sat and talked about lots of things for hours and hours and hours. And before I knew it, he moved his family to New York and joined my practice. So that's it. That, was <laughs> that is incredible. I feel like that's how it was when I reached out to you. I'm like, there's no way that they're going to get back to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I remember getting your phone call when we were planning the conference and you're like, sure, I could talk. And I remember running, I was just getting home and I was like, Jim, 
that that doctor that I reached out to, she she's calling me on the phone to talk to me. Was, it was oh, a very that's so exciting sweet. moment. Aww. Yeah, it it was really exciting um, to see. So that that's great. I actually didn't know that uh, yeah. you guys connected that way. But it yeah. is amazing when you see these complex conditions and just how everything is connected and those treatments that you know should work just aren't quite cutting it for these types of patients, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it may not exactly. be seven different things. It may be a uh, seven manifestations of one bigger picture issue. Exactly. And once you start to see how everything's connected, first of all, you can't unsee that, but but also it just provides so much more, you know, there's so many more options for treatment once you understand the root the root causes or yeah. cause in this case you know so my understanding because i started this research honestly because of my own kind of situation and rabbit holes probably 2019 or so kind of brushed the surface and my understanding of it was more that this is a spectrum right there's a lot of information about mastocytosis which is different than a activation syndrome, but it's sort of as a spectrum. Is that correct? Or can you explain that a little bit more? Sort of the, the distinction between mastocytosis and mast cell activation syndrome. So yeah, so mastocytosis is a really a cancer. It's a, it's a proliferative problem with mast cells. So the bone marrow is making a lot of mast cells. In, in the case of, of the systemic mastocytosis, there's a cutaneous mastocytosis that involves the skin, but basically it's, it's a lot of mast cells being produced. They're abnormal. They actually are activated abnormally. So you can have mastocytosis and mast cell activation syndrome, actually, mm. and many, many patients do because those mast cells, there's a lot of them and they are overactive. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're talking about, the vast majority of people have mast cell activation syndrome, meaning they have, this, they have a normal number of mast cells, but they are at, they're abnormal at baseline. They react inappropriately. Um, and so that's the main distinction. Again, mastocytosis is, is fairly rare, not, not, I mean, I've certainly seen it, you know, in my, in my practice and my career, but it's not, it's not as common mm -hmm. as mast cell activation syndrome, which could involve something like 17% of the population, according to some, some research. Yeah. That's what I've seen in various research to nationally, but also more worldwide. It kind of hits that, Correct. that same number. So where does histamine intolerance fall within this spectrum? Is it something that people deal with that have mast cell activation syndrome, or is it something entirely different? Yeah, I, I actually, that's such a great question because I, I think that's really one of the mis, mis, most misunderstood or the, yeah, or co most misunderstood concept, I would say, that I see uh, being thrown around in the integrative functional medicine community. And so I think it's worth kind of clarifying. So Histamine is a is a very um, uh, sort of ubiquitous chemical in our body. Um, it's actually produced by a lot of different cells, not just the mast cell. Uh, it is a neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, we eat food that has histamine in it. Uh, so, and we have different ways in our body to deal with histamine. So, what I'd like to say is that certainly. Um, there can be a relationship between mast cell activation syndrome and, and histamine intolerance. But, but, but not all patients with mast cell activation syndrome have histamine intolerance. And there's a subset of patients with histamine intolerance who may not have mast cell activation syndrome. And so Got I'll it. kind of distinguish between that. There are going to be are, the mast cells, patients who have a, a, abnormal mast cells, um, their mast cells can produce thousands of different chemicals. We call them mediators. They're the things that are being released from the mast cell on, in response to a trigger. Not all mast cells are making all thousand different chemicals, but in general, um, they make some subset of that. So histamine is one of the chemicals that mast cells mm -hmm. make. But as I mentioned, histamine can be produced by some other cells in the body as well. 
so so if um, the mast cells are producing histamine, let's say this is a patient that does actually make histamine in their mast cells, and the ma- and the mast cells are releasing histamine, they're going to have histamine related uh, symptoms. Mm-hmm. Now those mast cells are also making other chemicals and those other chemicals or mediators are actually having downstream effects causing inflammation, right? All Mm -hmm. these mediators in a sense cause inflammation, but they just do it a little differently, let's say, you know? So histamine has a certain way of acting on our body, has a certain way of acting in the respiratory tract. If you have too much histamine, you're going to be congested, right? Or you're going to have trouble breathing, or you're going to have itchy eyes, or you're going to have hives on your skin. Um, You might have, have problems digesting food, you might have reactions to food. So there are certain things we know are sort of histamine related. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, there are going to be people who who really histamine is not a major mediator for them. Got it. In fact, you know, we might measure it, they may not have a problem. So, so first, there's there's that that thing that that sort of scenario with, um, with mast cells. But then, um, you know, there, and people can have, have both of these issues, you have, if you have a lot of histamine, so let's just say uh, you, you're eating foods with histamine, let's say your mast cells are making or releasing histamine, maybe other cells are releasing histamine, and you have some, um, let's say, genetic vulnerabilities that uh, prevent you from breaking down histamine or blocking histamine yeah. properly, you're going to wind up with a problem. So we have an enzyme in our gut called diamine oxidase, or DAO. And so if you have enough of this enzyme, some of it is genetic, some of it is environmental, some of it is due to medications you take and other things that might lower or raise this DAO enzyme. But if you don't have enough of it, that enzyme is supposed to digest down histamine. So if you don't have mm-hmm. enough and, and you have too much histamine, you're going to have a lot of histamine. And, you know, again, the downstream effects from that. Um, the other way histamine is dealt with in the body is through methylation. Mm-hmm. Histamine has to be methylated to become methyl histamine. And, and methyl histamine then is sort of like, it goes through the liver and, and the kidneys, and it's basically peed out, pooped out, essentially, okay? So that you can test for as part of the workup, correct? It, it's correct. one of the markers in the urine to see how much you're producing. You measure it kind of indirectly by how much is methylated out of the body. Is that correct? Correct. You can measure that N methyl histamine. Um, and so if so the problem with that test is that if you don't have N methyl histamine in your in your urine, it could mean that you're not methylating, so you're not making it, or it could could be that you um don't have a histamine problem and you're not yes. and there's <laughs> and it's not gonna be you don't have to metabolize histamine, so you're not gonna find it in your urine. So it's you know, nuanced, I guess, is the mm-hmm. best way to, to put it. Um, so the so the histamine issue, again, is sort of multifaceted. There are lots of different ways to look at it. So there, again, there could be people who have, let's say, a DAO issue or a methylation issue who don't have a mast cell issue. Maybe they're not necessarily releasing histamine from their mast cells, and they still wind up with these histamine-like, you know, reactions. Yeah. I would argue, though, I say that, but I would argue that that the vast majority of those people probably do have a mast cell issue also, because what I have found is that there are very few people who really just have a histamine issue. Yeah. If they really just have a histamine issue and they have no other part of their body that's affected or they only have one part of their body that's having symptoms, all right, maybe. But if you have two or more systems involved it's going to be more likely to be mast cell activation syndrome. That's actually a really great explanation because it's hard to really find information to differentiate that. You know, if you're, if you're looking online, I remember when I first started, so I, I had thought, you know, maybe I have a histamine intolerance. I actually thought I was allergic to whiskey (laughs) at first. And well, that's possible. Actually, Very random. And I'm, you know, it started maybe around the same time that my endo symptoms started. I didn't know it was endo at the time either. And so I just noticed like, "Mm, interesting, like I'm, I think we were going to some like, fancier cocktail bars, and I was drinking um, old fashions, I really started to like them. And I started getting these hives every time. I was like, that's weird. So I stopped drinking whiskey. And then a few years later, I was at a friend's house and they really like whiskey. And I was like, you know, I'm going to try again. And it didn't happen. I was like, that's weird. 
So I didn't think much of it. And then occasionally it started happening every so often. And I was like, there has to be something that's similar in every instance that this is happening. I wasn't doing a lot of different things, but what I noticed it was around red wine, actually really never whiskey anymore. I, I've kind of honed it down to like rye whiskey, but it would always be with like charcuterie boards, aged meats, uh, these hard cheeses, red wine. And while it didn't happen every time, the only times it would happen, those things were present. And I was like, histamine. Okay. Didn't think much of it. Once or twice a year would happen. The severity would increase. And I started to pinpoint these things. And then I had my endo situation. I actually was working with some people that looked at methylation stuff and I had some methylation issues. I didn't put all of this together until like five, six years later, but then I had a really bad reaction to the COVID vaccine. Um, I got it early on oh. and right after I, I thought I had COVID and all of those symptoms like hives everywhere, m like multiple times a day, I would walk into the sun, a, a hot shower, it would cause it striations, these like burning hands and feet. And I was like, this is interesting. I went on a low histamine diet, it was still happening, started taking Claritin. And then it happened again after that second one, but it, it didn't go away after like a week or so. It kind of persisted. And that's when I started digging down. I think shortly before there was something about endo and mast cells. And then that happened. I was like, I got to go down this rabbit hole. So I started to look and a lot of what I was finding was a lot of functional medicine doctors, a lot of integrative health people. And I, I felt like it was not quite the exact right information. So it was very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, this was probably early 2021. And I didn't find a lot of medical doctors actually treating this. That's how I happened to find you and Dr. Afrin, actually. <laughs> Funny enough, and saw a local provider down wow. here, ended up being okay. It took uh, about eight months of, you know, trying different things for Zyrtec a day for about six months with, yeah. But, but it was okay. And now I'm, my body's a little bit more sensitive, but it really got me interested in looking at mast cell pathology or mast cell activation syndrome, kind of the pathology, the systems involved, because I had been doing a lot of research in endo starting our course. And when I was reading the research side by side, one for a project and one just for better understanding, I saw a lot of the same things being talked about. <laughs> And I was like, that's interesting. Oh, that is and nice. yeah, there's a, there's probably a handful of articles, research looking at mast cell involvement, uh, but nothing really clinically more, more research looking at different pathology and lesion types, I guess they're not clinical presentation. And so I still want to see more research and I don't think it exists yet, uh, but hopefully soon now that you you and Dr. Goldstein are connected. My point being was I started seeing a lot more people having similar situations or asking questions in different forums about endo and mast cell activation. Mm -hmm. And even in my patients, when my eyes were a little bit more open to it, I started noticing, wow, a lot of these people have, they've been on Flonase forever. They have seasonal allergies. They have gut issues. They have skin sensitivities and reactions and they have endo. Maybe they also have you know, at that time, I think maybe I was thinking histamine intolerance or mast cell activation. Mm -hmm. It was a, a very large number of them. Can you talk a little bit about the hormone interaction with mast cell? Yeah. Yeah. Issues? And, and thanks for sharing your journey. And I'm sorry that, that, uh, you know, you were dealing with all that, but, but look at where that took you, right. You're going to help more and more people, right. I think that, that sometimes, unfortunately, we have to go through some of this ourselves, right. To, yep. To help others, right? That's that's the positive spin on it. Um, but I think you know it's interesting because when I look back, just to get, not to get too sidetracked, but that connection you were making about these other conditions that they had along with endo, you know, was sort of a connection that I was making very early on with women I was seeing with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I had an interest mm. in women's health. So when I, when I um, you know, started in practice in 1999, I was, uh, I was seeing every, you know, it was internal medicine, so I saw everyone, but I had that sort of interest in women, women's health, women's, you know, hormones and polycystic ovarian syndrome. And 
and insulin resistance. And I was really very early on, very, key, you know, keyed in and clued into um, to some of the underlying issues that a lot of these women had. And I started noticing very early on that many of them had uh, migraines. They had mm. sometimes neuropsychiatric issues like anxiety or depression. They had, some of them had PMS, some of them, some of them didn't. Um, some of them had um, rapid weight gain and weight loss Sometimes they would have, um, you know, episodes of high blood pressure. Then there would be low blood pressure. Then there would be these, basically, yeah. lots of lots of things. Some of them had asthma, as I mentioned. Some of them had allergic type symptoms, but not always. But they had these other symptoms that went along mm -hmm. with them. I I never, I never had a a woman with PCOS who didn't have something else. And endometriosis was something that, um, you know, I started sort of wondering about with a lot of these patients, but you know how difficult it is to get diagnoses on them. But some of them had this sort of, you know, uh, presentation of pain mm -hmm. uh, very early on, right? There were some th clues there. And so when I started understanding mass cell activation syndrome, and then I went back and started looking at my PCOS patients, then it was like, wait a second, um, I think these are related. And I would say now, I, I can say this, and it's it's kind of weird as a, as a medical professional to use 100% here, but 100%, yeah. I never say 100% of anything. I usually say 99, 100% <laughs> of my PCOS patients in my practice have mast cell activation syndrome. Wow. And I think that that's, that's incredible. So far, so far. 100%. If you have PCOS, you have mass activation syndrome so far in my practice, and they've been proven. Now, it's hard to prove PCOS. That's a whole other thing. That's one of the things that I actually want to publish on. It's hard to prove it because it's a clinical diagnosis. Well, mass yeah. activation syndrome can be a clinical diagnosis too. So it's hard to get things like this published, but we definitely yeah. see the association. And um, and so the point is that um, so hormones definitely are are involved, right? Yeah. And so that was the the question: How is it involved? Why did women with PCOS have this immune dysregulation yes. that I was seeing? Uh, and the other thing I'll mention: Sometimes they'd had they'd have abnormal thyroid function. They'd have these other things, and you would wonder, but maybe they weren't, you know, overtly hypothyroid. There was something going on. So um, so what I've you know, come to understand, and um, and the research does support this, is that these mast cells have receptors on their surface. I think of them as like mm -hmm. antennas, and they're reading the environment. That's sort of how they work. They they are looking for changes. They're your front line of defense. Yep. So they have receptors for various things, and they have hormone receptors. They have receptors to estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Um, and, and actually, and other, and insulin, um, and they can detect those changes in the hormone levels at very minuscule amounts. So even at, in the, the local environment. So if the yeah. ovary is seeing a burst of estrogen during a certain part of the cycle, right, the mast cells in that area are going to be alerted to it. The estrogen is going to bind the, the mast cell. The mast cell is going to say, okay, I have to do something. So it's going to release the mediators. Those mediators are inflammatory, but they, but, but they have some positive functions too. Right. Um, it's when there's too much of them, that's the problem. And then that sort of, um, that release of the inflammatory uh, chemicals and mediators are, is really what probably leads to things like ovulation in yeah. some ways, believe it or not, or painful ovulation. Yeah. You know, I think those women who have that middle schmerz symptom, like some women, they ovulate, they don't know. There's some women who know when they ovulate, they feel yeah. it. Why? Well, I think that some of it may be rooted in this. Maybe they have dysfunctional mast cells. They have maybe uh, more... Um, perception of pain. There's, there's definitely an interaction between pain and, uh, and pain perception and, um, and mast cells. And so then let's say this is happening at the level of the ovary and then, you know, this is happening. So, so you can imagine all these other things that the interaction between the hormones and the mast cells can lead to. I haven't gone down this rabbit hole, but I was reading in some research where it talked about the role of histamine in 
sexual functioning in a positive way, right? It plays a role, like you were saying, to maybe maybe kick off that ovulation. And I think about them as maybe hypersensitive. So they're maybe being triggered. It's like an action potential, right? Where you it's an all or nothing. It has to reach a certain level before it gets activated. Is that kind of like how mast cells are in some ways? If somebody has mast cell activation syndrome, can they be hypersensitive or they, will they always be triggered by that substance or that trigger just overreactive in how much of those uh, chemicals are released? No, that's a, that's a great question, actually. And um, the way I would think about it is that it's probably both, okay? Mm-hmm. So, so people with mast cell activation syndrome at baseline have abnormal release of mediators from the mast cell. So, so think about it this way. There are going to be people who, everyone has mast cells. Yes. And if, you're, if you don't have MCAS, what you have is mast cells that are waiting for the, the trigger. Okay, They're waiting for an infection. They're waiting for something. And they will kick into gear and react. But people with MCAS, they, and, and just by the way, when they react, let's say they get COVID or a COVID vaccine or whatever, and they have a reaction, um, they then will reset and their, and their mast cells, their normal mast cells return to normal waiting for that next big trigger. If you have MCAS, Which is normal. Which is that's normal. normal. Okay. Correct. Correct. Because that's the thing. Everybody's mast cells will react at some point in their life about something, but they will reset. But if at baseline you have mutated mast cells, they're abnormal and they're always spilling out some of these chemicals. So they're causing a low level of inflammation pretty constantly. Some of that you might feel, some of it you you won't. You will think a lot of patients think that when they have they have a reaction to uh, COVID or COVID vaccine, I hear this all the time, and now they're still sick, they have long COVID, and they say, I was normal before, and now I have long COVID after COVID. And what, I, we, what we're starting to understand is that they probably had dysfunctional mast cells before COVID. They didn't realize it. They had some very vague symptoms, vague things that happened in their life. No one made a big deal about it. They didn't, they didn't make a big deal, big deal about it until they had a major event. But there's this low level stuff that's happening. Again, some, some people feel it. Some people are tuned into it. Some people don't. And then there are these triggers that then bring them out. And then what could happen mm-hmm. is that when you have a big trigger, the mast cells may not return to the baseline they were at before the trigger. So I think about it like if you're normal and your baseline is low and you're abnormal and your baseline is a little higher, then you have a big trigger, you bring your baseline up, that may not return all the way down to the base, the, the baseline of normal. It may not return to the baseline of where it was before the big, mm. the big event. That so that's why sense. over time people become more sensitive. They think back and they said, yeah, I had that episode of hives or I had that episode of migraines. I got better. It's rare that they go back to 100% better. They have a new baseline. Yeah. Does that that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. People ask too, you know, can this ever go away? And it sounds like, yes, but you need the right things in place to get back to that baseline. But you may always be more sensitive than somebody else that doesn't have these predisposing factors. Yeah. And I think, look, I, I am an optimist and I love, I love to do these types of things and, you know, podcast education because, because I want people to have hope and I, I really want, you know, them to feel like there, there are lots of answers, but I think it's just realistic to know that most likely, if you have this, it's there. It's going to be there. Yeah. It's not going to go away. All of a sudden, mutated mast cells don't disappear. Yeah. But So you may be more sensitive, but can you, over time, get that baseline lower and lower? I think you can, and that's the work that I do. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. I mean, I was diagnosed with MCAS, and I, I do feel like I'm not the same as before, but I... 
I don't have those same reactions. I do feel like I have to be a little bit more careful for sure. Um, that resilience I gained between those, you know, episodes of hives, but I definitely was not how I was, you know, initially. So that's what got me really interested. And, I, and I've seen it in my patients too. I started to do a little bit more work with the nutrition and integrative health program on my end, but also working with some of the physicians that do this because I think it, it has to be both. I can't, as a nutritionist, you know, I can give education and I can talk to some things but some people, it, it's not enough. For a lot of people, it's not enough. For a lot of people, it's a big piece, but they still need to really get a workup and see a provider that's knowledgeable to really understand all the factors. Exactly. Let, I, I do want to kind of pick your brain a little bit about the last few years with COVID and, and what you saw in your practice, especially with women that had PCOS or suspected endo or, or had endo. What did you see? How did How was that? Yeah. Well, it was it was rough for everybody, right? I mean, it was a tough time for a lot of reasons. Um, I think there were a couple of different scenarios that I can, you know, lump patients into, right? I mean, there's obviously a lot of variability and everyone's different, but, you know, we had patients that um, knew they had MCAS going into it. Uh, they were fairly well controlled. They had their regimen. Uh, they, let's say, had to get a vaccine or they got the virus. And um, I mean, the, listen, the first round of that virus was pretty cruel. And um, Absolutely. even well, even people who were well controlled, you know, uh, it was tough. But but as the virus sort of changed, I would say that if they went, if the patients generally were on uh, H1 and H2 blockers and they were on mast cell stabilizers and they felt that their symptoms were generally well controlled and they were you know, able to function uh, at a at a relatively higher high level, if they got you know COVID or or the vaccine, uh, and I hate to lump them together, but we're starting to see that they probably can be lumped together. Um, they they fared pretty well. Did they need maybe more support? Absolutely. Did it maybe take a little longer than people who did not have MCAS? Yes, I, I think so. Um, but but you know, I was encouraged, and I still am encouraged by the fact that I think we can, you know, we could get the, them through that, and um, and they fared well. The the patients who did not know that they had MCAS, yeah. so they had no nothing on board. Um, their their mast cells went crazy. That whole talk about the cytokine storm and all that. Yeah. I mean, the mast cells were absolutely involved in that, along with other cells, but. Um, a lot of those patients who then um, did not know that they had a mast cell problem, were not treated appropriately, continued to have activation of their mast cells long after the virus uh, or the spike protein from the uh, vaccine was gone. And they, um, yeah, their, their symptoms lingered and it's been much harder to, to treat for lots of, lots of reasons. Um, so those are the, those, those, those are the challenges. I, it, there's something more than just MCAS in those patients who have long yes. haul COVID. I don't want to simplify it and say it's only yeah. that, but, but the MCAS part is a, it was a big piece of the puzzle and, and it seems like they were not well controlled and they, they, it was a little harder for them to, to get over, over it. Did you see any themes in how they presented yeah, not a lot. And that's, and that's the, that's the thing, you know, everyone's mast cells are different. Everybody's mast cells are mutated differently, produce different mediators are worse in certain parts of the body and not in other parts yeah. of the body. I mean, sure. Fatigue is, it was like a really, you know, a uh, huge, huge yeah. symptom that, right. Um, and pretty pervasive. Uh, but beyond the fatigue, you know, we had the patients who had more respiratory symptoms and we have patient mm -hmm. had patients who had no respiratory symptoms, um, you know, they had more GI symptoms or they had more um, uh, interstitial cystitis type symptoms or they had more hormonal symptoms. I definitely have patients that I think probably um, maybe they had endo before COVID, mm -hmm. um, but they seem to have worsening endo after COVID or they're at least getting a diagnosis pain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure with some of that too, especially with the respiratory, that's so hard to differentiate, you know, is this due to getting COVID or is it the presentation of MCAS? Yeah. I guess in patients with, with endo specific, since this is our endo podcast, yes, um, yes. what would be things that people that have endo, 
if they are considering or they're asking questions about mast cell activation, what would they look for potentially? Or based, I know based on what you've seen, I know that there's probably significant variability in individuals, but what would be some things that they may look for to see if, hey, this is something I should check out? In terms of symptoms? Yeah. Or in terms of, yeah. Um, so again, I think that, um, you know, one of the hallmark features of mast cell activation syndrome is that it involves two or more systems. It is a multi-system mm -hmm. inflammatory condition. So if the symptoms are confined to endo uh, and the GU tract and really doesn't expand beyond that, right, it's probably unlikely that MCAS is involved. Having said that, I don't know many endo patients who don't have other symptoms. Yeah. Is that, you, is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, that's correct. Because okay. you, have, you have overlapping pain conditions like IBS, interstitial cystitis called correct. the evil twins. We talk a lot about SIBO. And, you know, Dr. Dr. Weinstock wrote that paper about SIBO and IC and the use of rifaximin, which I do use because these are three of the most common yeah. things you see but also then you can have fatigue. Fatigue is a huge symptom of patients with endometriosis, pain, infertility issues. Um, it's not an autoimmune disease, but it is correlated with a lot of autoimmune diseases. So yeah, you're getting a ton of different systems involved already with endo. Right, exactly. So it is really a truly multi-system inflammatory disorder. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and PCOS is the same. Uh, yeah. I used to say the same thing. It has an autoimmune like sort of presentation or association, but it's not autoimmune. And that's, that's mm -hmm. sort of the, the flavor of mass cell activation syndrome. It's not autoimmune, but some patients have autoimmune issues or autoimmune like sort of phenomena happening. Um, so, so I guess going back to your question, you know, I think that if uh, patients have symptoms that are even beyond the things that you mentioned, um, then obviously it's, I mean, those are important, obviously, but, but more, you know, I think, I think about, again, every system, right? So the nervous system beyond pain, um, is there a neuropathy? Is there a neuropsychiatric problems, anxiety, depression, OCD, oh, yeah. eating disorders, not uncommon mm. in this population, um, autism, not uncommon. There are just things that, you know, um, I have a patient who um, has uh, PCOS, which I've known for a long time. I've treated her for a long time. And then recently she says, I just went to the, the psychiatrist and she says, I was just diagnosed with autism. Do you think there's a link? And I said, oh, that's interesting because I've always suspected MCAS, wow. but I never got a chance to really to test her. So then we started testing her like, wow, guess what? She has PCOS. She has autism. She has MCAS. That's not surprising. They are, they can go together and yeah. trying to get her off birth control pills oh, wait a second, I think she has endo. She's been treated in a way that probably has suppressed it on some level, mm -hmm. but uh, now now I think she has that. So so these are things that, you know, these often are things to think about. Um, migraines, definitely very, very, and headaches in general, very, very common. Yeah. Um, I think about things like the trifecta with MCAS. We think about... Um, Oh, I liked how you said the endometriosis and interstitial cystitis, right? That's the evil twin. Yep. So we say the trifecta of mast cell activation syndrome, oh, like ED, e EDS, or Los Danlos, or, or hypermobility syndromes, and, uh, and POTS, or dysautonomia. Um, so those are, those are things that seem to correlate. They seem to go together. You don't have to. You could have one, not the other. Um, you know, but, but, you know, we could say the same about endo. We could think you can, we can say, oh, you can have endo, but not these other things, but do you really have endo and not these other things? Do you really have MCAS and don't have anything else going on? Probably yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. I think the sympathetic nervous system, I'll just br bring up one more point before we, take, yeah. I think the sympathetic nervous system for a lot of these patients is heightened. Mm -hmm. um, so they are in a fight or flight mode, 
mm-hmm. all the time. That's, but that's kind of, I, I look at it, it's almost like how they were born. That's how their nervous system has developed. That's going to affect their perception of pain. That's going to affect their perception of the environment. And that's going to translate to their mast cells also and how it perceives it. I mean, I think you mentioned this earlier too, briefly, mast cells are the barrier, right? The first line of defense. And something I read that was really fascinating was talking about our immune system and mast cells, one of those very old cells that we've known about for a very long time, right? Because our immune system is keeping us alive and it's reactive to anything and everything. It's nonspecific, though it can trigger responses for specific mediators like anti or antibodies, things like that. It really is. And so the things that I like to think about is what what is coming into and in, in contact with the environment. So why our skin has it, why our mucosa has it from our, you know, respiratory all the way through our, our GI tract to the rectum, because those tissues are always in constant response of the environment. And so you sure. see a lot of presentation in mast cell issues or histamine even because of that, uh, sure. because of where they are. But of course, like you mentioned, they're they're throughout the body. So it amazed me the first mast cell doctor that I went to, which now I now I know what I know. And he's like, nope, respiratory, GI, and skin. That's it. There's people call in about, you know, anxiety and central nervous and brain fog. And when I was, I was like, that doesn't quite make sense to me. But now I know better. Right. <laughs> so listen to things right. like that. But yeah, you yeah. see these issues in all of all of the people with with these diagnoses. I would say the one exception is some people that have a manifestation more of infertility oftentimes don't have a lot of these other symptoms, which is really fascinating to me. Endo is sort of thought is an afterthought almost after IDF has been tried and failed. Nothing Uh else is wrong. So that has always interested me that it is fascinating that so many people with infertility that's caused by endo oftentimes don't have the pain, the, the painful period. There's no indication. Yeah. That's an excellent point. And, and to take that a step further, some of those patients um, I've seen now years after their fertility journey, and they've had, they are very symptomatic. They may not have pain. You're right. That may not be their primary thing, but they had stuff going on. Their mast cells were dysfunctional at that, at that time. But again, pain may not be their, their issue. Um, So they have endo and they have all these other manifestations. And, uh, but again, they go, they, they're under the radar, right? Because Mm -hmm. they don't have the classic symptoms, but they go through a fertility um, uh, treatment, they go through IVF, that causes, let's say, hyperstimulation of the ovaries, which really gets those mast cells going. And maybe the mast cells actually are contributing to that hyperstimulation. And then they're never the same. And I have a number of those patients Mm. who, you know, remember that actually the egg retrieval, the whatever it is that they were going through during that fertility cycle or cycles um, actually was the trigger that then really set things off, which is really unfortunate. I can't imagine undergoing the egg retrieval, it, do that whole process, which is emotionally draining, painful, and then coming out of it with this, these other symptoms, that just sounds awful. Yeah, it's, it's not fair. But I, again, I think that the more we educate, and the more mm-hmm. doctors are tuned into it, the more, you know, we can maybe preventatively yeah. Um, you know, treat these women. So, so let's say a woman has an infertility and she's, and they're not clear all the causes, but maybe endo is suspected. Um, and, and she's going to go through maybe some surgery or whatever else is going to be indicated, right? Should we be using mast cell targeted therapy before surgery? Should we be doing things to get her as healthy, quote unquote, healthy as possible, stable as possible, will that have, you know, a a positive effect long term? Absolutely. I I think a lot of people would agree to say that. And and a lot of people do, but I don't think that they're looking at the mast cell component of it. That is fascinating. I'm sure any, anything to calm down all of the systems, whether it's pain, central nervous system, dysfunction, anxiety, you're always going to have a better outcome from that. 
I want to switch gears for a second because this has been something that I've been dying to really dig into. And since it's come up a bunch of different forums, is the topic of pelvic congestion syndrome. I have seen some fascinating things come through on the threads. The one population I will say that I see it most prominent in is endo. Unknowingly, when they go in for surgery, they see it, they document it, and sort of nothing else is done. But in many different uh, situations I see in public health, not just endo, I think that there's some connection. And because I've been seeing it come up so much, I wanted to talk a little bit about pelvic congestion syndrome. And does that have anything to do with mast cell issues? Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because we're part of that same mast cell study group, listserv, right? And we see this this is like a hot topic for us right now. And, um, and so I'm certainly not the expert on that on that topic. It's something that I'm super interested in as you are, as you are as well. And um, I'm starting to think about it more and more with my patients um, who have chronic pelvic pain of various types, mm-hmm. even in, even in men who now yes. I look back and say, wait a second, you know, um, they have these diagnoses of chronic prostatitis. They have these things that, but they never really clear up. Maybe there's more to the story. And so I'm really, really interested in this uh, connection. Look, look, you know, these mast cells are in the lining of the blood vessels, right? They're in that endothelial layer. Um, so they're, they're involved in the function of the vasculature, right? So I have to imagine that the mast cells are playing some role um, in the integrity, let's say, of the blood vessels, right? Um, we also know that mast cells can produce various mediators that are involved in clotting, Mm-hmm. Or 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 thinning of blood, right? At various in various ways. So I can imagine how that might affect again, like blood flow through the 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 veins. I think that some of these patients have um, connective tissue issues. There's ma- there's there are mast cells in the connective tissue, and in that in that the the collagen layer of the blood vessels. Right. Yeah. So that's maybe affecting again integrity and stability mm-hmm. of the veins. You know, because I think this concept of this venous congestion, I think, is really complex because it's sort of like, well, what's causing that congestion? Why is it exactly right? So I think there's a structural component, absolutely. Like there's something maybe block blocking, um, like like indirectly. Yeah. You know, there may be maybe. Um, anatomy, something that's mm-hmm. getting in the way. But then there's something about the structure of the veins themselves that it seems like that might be uh, be affecting it. And I think the mast cells are somehow, and maybe it's a two-way street, this issue will definitely make mast cells worse, but are the mast yeah. cells involved in this process? And I don't think, I don't think we know. I think we're just starting to get, you know, get more interest in this. Yeah, I'm very fascinated. But it started out actually with the men that the men, the male threads that were on that lift serve. And I was like, I think that this is a lot of patients I'm seeing and I think it's being missed. And then it, when I saw the endo threads come up, I was like, yes, that makes sense too, because that's where I see it most diagnosed by accident is in endometriosis. So I, yeah, that's the next major rabbit right. hole to go down. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to be going down that same, we'll, we'll go down the rabbit hole together yeah. because it's hard for me to put that together completely and mm-hmm. understand how the endo, the, the, what's the, the word I'm looking for? Yeah. Well, the, no, the endometriosis, like oh. how those, those areas of endometriosis are, are forming and how does that, how does that, that relate to the venous congestion? Like, what is that connection? I just don't know. I don't know if I can wrap my right. brain around right now. And I don't know that it's a causative factor. I think it's more correlated due to maybe a third factor. Yeah. yeah. And, and the mast cells may, maybe yeah. it's, it's through that connection, right? I always was wondering with the hypermobility spectrum, what is the mechanism of the mast cell involvement to cause the hypermobility? Is it just the type of collagen that lays down or the lack of a type of collagen that lays down from it? Or what is that mechanism? Yeah, and I think it's it's complicated for sure, right? Everything we're talking about is complicated. Yeah. Um, 
there there are people there are definitely patients who have hypermobility um, and have uh, EDS or various these various connective tissue disorders who do not have mast cell activation syndrome, right? And we've I've, we've said that before, right? There's like a theme, like you can have one thing and not have the mm-hmm. other, right? Um, so there are a number of some of them are genetic issues that lead to changes in the connective tissue. Um, so again, again, that's going to be beyond the mast cells, but there is a subset of patients that really seem to get worsening connective tissue issues or maybe even present with connective tissue issues um, when their mast cells are become more and more dysfunctional. So the mm-hmm. more dysfunctional the mast cells are, the worse their connective tissue is. And they can develop a variety of, of serious complications. Cranial cervical instability is one that I see quite a bit. Um, but but there but there are others. So so the mast cells can release uh, one of the one of the chemicals or mediators they make is is um, col- uh, collagenase. Okay. Uh, they make elastase. So there are things that actually enzymes that break actually break down, oh. eat away at the Interesting. collagen. Interesting. That makes a lot more sense. I was thinking it was more the release of something to cause something. Well, I guess that is well, releasing yeah. that. But I yeah. was thinking not along those lines, like an effect that would weaken it, like a poor healing sort of situation, which maybe could be a sit. But it too. could be also. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And maybe all the above. Yeah, there's definitely a subset of my patients that have all of these as well. And it's been you just like you said it you said it best when you when you see it you can't unsee it anymore <laughs> and i'll tell you i'll tell you an interesting oh so sorry i'll tell you like a little anecdotal yeah. story with a patient so we typically think of hypermobility connective tissue disorders as like being more flexible that's kind of what what you know that people picture but i had a patient actually who i would consider or and she considered herself fairly stiff Mm -hmm. So she would never even think about, no one would ever think that she had some kind of connected tissue issue, but she was stiff. You know, she definitely was tight. You know, people would tell her, oh, you have tight hamstrings, et cetera, et cetera. And what was interesting is that when, and she had other issues that we were treating, and when we treated her, when we discovered that she had MCAS and we treated her MCAS, one of the things she noticed, which was really fascinating to me, was that she became less stiff and more flexible. Interesting. Not, necess- not necessarily hypermobile, but significant enough that I remember her telling me, and I and I had her in the office and I had her do this. So she would be somebody, if you ask them to touch, you know, touch her, touch her toes, right? Go down, touch your toes, right? So maybe she could touch her shins under her knees. That's the furthest she could go, right? So yeah. we treat her for her mast cells and now she could bend down and touch her toes. And I'm thinking, okay, now that's really interesting. So we reduced inflammation in the connective tissue. It had nothing to do necessarily with hypermobility, but I thought that yeah. was, you know, something that I, I learn all the time from my patients. You know? My PT brain gets set off because to me, that makes sense. Oh. If you have instability, your muscles are going to come in and protect because your muscles are not the same thing as your connective tissue, right? In the sense, your ligaments and your Correct. joints. And so I also think about it in, in patients that, they come to me and they're like, yeah, I think I have EDS or I've been diagnosed. And I look and I'm like, mm. but I don't, I don't write that off because I know, well, you're, they're the people that always want to stretch and stretch and stretch to the end ranges. Cause it feels good. But those are the people that should not be stretching to the end ranges because exactly. the muscles can tighten up and cause you to stiffen up in protection mode to some degree. But when you actually relax everything, you might notice more ligament laxity and mobility in their actual joints if you can get through that muscle. Right. So yeah. I love that you had your your <laughs> your PT brain on there and interpreted that for me. That's excellent. Your practice with Dr. Afrin is in New York. It's it's just you two. Is that correct? We have a PA um, who's with us as well, Dr. Colin Renaud. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and we're, you know, so he does more, uh, functional medicine. He treats MCAS too, obviously he's in in our practice, but, um, he does, you know, a lot of hormone stuff and functional, uh, functional medicine. I do everything as well, you know, with a big emphasis on root cause medicine, right? So it's, um, looking for the root cause of, of, uh, immune dysfunction, like, like Mm -hmm. MCAS, but 
I do a lot. And, and, and Dr. Afford really does concentrate on the MCAS part. So I kind of feel like we all have our little niches, you know. Yeah, you specialize in a lot of these other co-infections, Lyme disease, Correct. Bartonella, which Correct. is a whole other world and topic that we could go That's down. Right. But, <laughs> That's um, but I know your practice is quite busy because we need more of all of you. So if somebody is suspecting that they have MCAS or they hear this podcast, what, what can they do now? What should they, they be looking for? And how can they find somebody like you? Okay, so well, let me let me answer this the last question first, and I'll say that um, while I'm not taking on new patients right in 2023, um, but but you know we're hoping for 2024, um, uh, and I am looking for other practitioners to join me. So if anybody's listening and wants to move to New York, I would love to. You know, we we're 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 growing really rapidly. We could definitely use some help. But um, but Dr. Renard and Dr. Afrin are seeing patients, are taking new patients. So if people are interested oh, in looking more into our practice, you know, our website is aimcenterpm.com. Uh, it's the AIM Center for Personalized Medicine. And um, and but obviously we I also do a lot of education, right? So um, I have my drtanyademc.com, my own website, and and Dr. Tanya Dempsey, um, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. So I try to put out as much content as possible because I think that I just want to, um, yeah, I just want to empower people to have this information because the reality is that, yeah, they may be in parts of the world, parts of the country that mm-hmm. where they can, don't have access to people who can do the work that I do. So, you know, whatever they can do to, to start to help themselves, right, I think is, is huge. Um, I think that, you know, what, I, what I'm hoping, right, these are, these are the dreams that we're going to create a network of, of, of practitioners. We're going to train more and more practitioners. We're going to train medical students from like very, very early on um, so that there are more providers who can treat patients like that like this, you know, that, that, that they have the ability to. So, so there's, there's hope. Um, and I'll mention that I'm actually working on a documentary with Dr. Lenny Weinstock um, on MCAS. This is like hot off the press. So, Can't wait um, to watch it. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're working, we're on our fundraising mode right now. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a big endeavor, but you know, again, the key is actually our hope is with this documentary is not just to put the information out and to educate uh, the public, but also we're, we're, we're going to um, uh, collate basically uh, presentations from many MCAS uh, docs out there that are part of our group and, um, and provide these presentations to medical schools, to training programs, because we really, really feel like that's where the need is, right? We've got to get the message out and we've got to do it early enough in, in doctor's trainings because, you know, once you're already even a resident or once you're practicing, uh, you know, if you're an allergist, you're going to see things a certain way. If you're another specialist, mm-hmm. you're going to see things a certain way. So we've got to get to them before they, they are jaded already, you know? So anyway, that's our, that's our goal with this documentary. And so, um, uh, and there, and we have a, we have a web page on LDN research trust is actually going to be filming it. Um, and they're working with us, collaborating with us to, to do this project so that we have a web page, um, about, this documentary, they've been amazing. They're going to be uh, filming it and all that. So that's sort of like, okay, well, these are, you know, things, resources. Um, but just on an individual level, you know, I think that, um, you know, patients should be trying to identify triggers the best they can, you know, try to figure out what in their life may be contributing to them being sick. Some things are going to be um, easier, never easy, but easier um, to, to at least think about, you know, what is the, what is the air, what is the air you're breathing in? Like, what is the stuff you're putting in your body? Like, you know, is, are there, is there mold in the environment? Are there, are there, uh, things that you're eating that you shouldn't be eating that you're reacting to, you know, start to, to think about those things. I think that's like a, like a first step anyway, you know? Yeah. Observe. So that's a lot. I mean, what can they do? A lot, but yeah. you know, ideally they would be able to find someone, right, to to work with them. Is there a like central resource like through a MCAS or no? Not yet. Okay. We're working on it. Not okay. yet. But but that's coming. That may be part of the documentary. Oh, in a great. Sense. 
are there things that patients should be aware of to caution or avoid whether that's a certain type of treatment or style of mm. treatment or yes yeah yeah great actually that's a great question i'm so glad you asked that and i don't want to sound critical okay i i i do um expect i i do have very high standards yeah okay and i have high standards for myself i have high standards for the patients that i treat so, you know, what I would say is one of the things that I see that concerns me is, is there are practitioners out there who are starting to understand MCAS, right? And, and like kudos to them for, you know, under, trying to understand and try to help people. But if they don't really understand truly how to approach the treatment, if they're really not, I will call, I'll say trained in a way, Mm -hmm. um, then, then sometimes it's not a good situation. So what yeah. that could look like is that they give the patient, you know, five or 10 supplements to start at the same time, um, and, uh, not really considering the reactivity trialing one, one thing at a time. So I think that, yeah, to be aware of that sort of approach, it, it, you need someone who understands that, this is a process. We want to get you better quickly. Yeah, we want you better yesterday or last week, but but there has to be um, this has to be a methodical, structured approach. And so, if you don't have somebody who understands that approach, it's one thing at a time. Understanding, you know, what that one thing is doing before you move on to the next thing, then that that's trouble. And so, that's what I would say is just to be cautious of. It's not that they're they're they don't mean well. I want to be clear. This is people out there who are doing this work who want to treat MCAS patients. I think have the best of hearts. I they want to help people. I think they just don't necessarily understand the complexity of treating patients with MCAS. Yeah, I think a lot of people listening will really appreciate that because it's the same when we think about endometriosis and providers. Mm -hmm. Many are well intentioned, but many really don't truly understand it. It ends up in a worse situation a lot of the time. So I don't think anyone here will think you're being critical because that's their life in general with endo. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was so great. I could probably spend three more hours at least we can with spend you. <laughs> hours together. I, I love it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged, presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms, at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis.